Children do weird things. Sometimes we can't explain their peculiarities, or the chief complaint seems low risk, and after a thorough H&P, we may just have to say, children do weird things. What if that complaint doesn't seem low risk? What if the complaint is about the child's breathing? The first thing to figure out is whether there is difficulty breathing or just noisy breathing. A worried parent will have a hard time differentiating between the two, but it's our job to bring down the temperature in the room, connect with the parents, and let them know that you're concerned with figuring this out. The interaction will be much more fruitful. You've done a good history and physical. The child seems stable, but you're still left wondering, is the bark worse than the bite? What to do with the squeaks, the squawks, and the snores? You make tough calls when caring for acutely ill and injured children. Join us for strategy and support through clinical cases, research, and reviews, and best practice guidance in our ever-changing acute care landscape. This is your Pediatric Emergency Playbook. Welcome to the Playbook. I'm your host and coach, Tim Horechko. Today we'll go over the most common causes of strider, stertor, and snoring. All of them are the result of turbulent airflow, but if we pay attention to the age, the quality of the sound, and the timing of the abnormal sound in the respiratory cycle, we can often either make the diagnosis on the spot or at least have a working diagnosis and plan. Here's a roadmap for today's playbook from cephalad to caudad. Snoring is turbulent airflow at the nasopharynx, and the palate. Stertor is very similar with turbulence at the base of the tongue, the tonsils, and the hypopharynx. Strider occurs at the larynx or the trachea. Wheezing is turbulence in the peripheral lower airways. We'll go through each and try to pin down what exactly is that unnerving newborn noise. Let's go with the most pressing presentation first. Strider is the sound of turbulent airflow caused by obstruction in the upper aerodigestive tract. This may be laryngeal or tracheobronchial. The sound and pitch of strider will depend on what's happening with the airflow dynamic. When you hear then ask yourself, what's happening during the respiratory cycle? Is this inspiratory, expiratory, or is it both? Is it biphasic? Don't think. It's intuitive. <coughs> That's inspiratory. You can have both inspiratory and expiratory. <coughs> Just remember that expiratory strider is not the same as wheezing. Wheezing can be high-pitched, low-pitched, musical. It can change when you treat it. There's lots of variation in your little organ pipes of the various sizes that blow air out. So let's just think this through for a moment. If strider is dynamic airway obstruction at the larynx or trachea, it's almost always starting inspiratory and can progress to both inspiratory and expiratory. Breathing in takes effort, and you have a whole cadre of muscles to contract and help you draw air in. We are simply better at breathing in than breathing out. Breathing out for a healthy person is passive. We just let the air out. Since we can generate a lot of negative inspiratory pressure, it's understandable that the more effort we make in breathing in, the more sound we can make. Try it yourself. Right now. Try to make yourself sound stridulous. Do it. Safe space. I won't say a thing. Now, try making noise while breathing out. 
it's harder, right? My point here is that inspiratory strider almost always precedes expiratory strider. Wheezing can sometimes sound similar, but wheezing is only expiratory. You hear this noisy breather. Think, where is the air getting squeezed, getting compressed? That is where the obstruction is. By the way, when we speak about obstruction in terms of airway, it's not an all or nothing thing. You can't be totally obstructed and live for long. We're talking varying degrees of partial obstruction here. If the strider happens only when the child breathes in, then there's some obstruction in the supraglottic region. So is that the uvula, the base of the tongue, the soft tissues of the pharyngeal walls, the epiglottis? You may also see suprasternal or intercostal retractions as the child tries to suck that air in. Expiratory strider is a partial obstruction below the glottis or at the proximal trachea. Is the thyroid or cricoid cartilage enlarged? Is there tracheal edema or trauma? Of course, the good old foreign body can do that too. You may hear a barking cough because the child is trying to increase his positive pressure to get air out. Or you may see nasal flaring or xiphoid retractions in expiratory strider. What if the obstruction is at the level of the glottis? Or if you have a critical obstruction anywhere along the airway axis, you'll hear biphasic strider on both inspiration and expiration. To be honest though, it's usually not balanced. It's mostly inspiratory with a backbeat on the expiratory phase. Listen next time you have a stridulous patient. Yeah, I said it, stridulous, not striderous. That's not a real word. A patient is stridulous when he has strider. The most common cause of strider for us in the ED is going to be the acquired type, the transient type due to, say, croup. However, in the bigger world out there, the vast majority, 85% of cases of strider, are congenital. It's some anatomic abnormality that rears its ugly head by about two months of age. If the first time a child has strider and he is older, let's say maybe like five, six months of age, then it's probably acquired and you already know all about this. You know about croup and you know what to do. But it's just as important to remember the many other causes of strider because you will see a child with this and the younger the infant, the more concerned we should be. In short, strider is a symptom. We take a good history, we do a good physical exam, and if there's an unclear picture, you can always escalate to flexible laryngoscopy, even at the bedside. Now, granted, we won't have the same facility with laryngoscopy that the ear, nose, and throat surgeons have, but it's a good start if you have the capability. Other modalities that are more at our fingertips are soft tissue x-rays of the neck, maybe a barium esophagram, or even a CT of the neck and chest it just depends on what we're looking for, but more about that in a moment. Acquired strider is the type that we're all comfortable with. Say croup, for example, or laryngotracheobronchitis. It occurs in children six months of age to six years of age with that barky seal-like cough, and you know the rest. Epiglottitis is rare nowadays in the vaccinated child, but then again, the unvaccinated population is on the rise. Ask all of your great questions about the possibility of a laryngeal foreign body. An overlooked possibility is laryngeal papilloma, also called juvenile recurrent respiratory papilloma, which unfortunately occurs because of exposure perinatally to human papillomavirus. Congenital strider opens up a whole Pandora's box of squeaks and squawks, but the three big ones are laryngomalacia, vocal cord paralysis, and subglottic stenosis. We'll focus on these three. But just so that I put a little bug in your ear, other causes of congenital strider 
are what you would not diagnose in the ED, but we should just be aware of them. So examples are laryngeal webs or clefts or tracheoesophageal fistulae or laryngeal or subglottic cysts, subglottic hemangiomas, tracheomalacia, tracheal stenosis, vascular rings, pulmonary artery slings, and on and on. So again, we'll just focus on the heavy hitters of congenital strider, the ones that we really should know. Laryngomalacia, vocal cord paralysis, and subglottic stenosis. Laryngomalacia is the number one cause of strider in the newborn. These are the squeaky cuties who sound terrible, but are actually usually okay. There's a two to one male to female ratio. Strider presents shortly after birth and worsens for the first two months or so. Laryngomalacia is the result of a combination of abnormal anatomy, possibly a neuromuscular disorder, and or reflux. This special mix sets off a chain reaction. You get some supraglottic airway irritation, causing partial airway obstruction, causing altered respiratory mechanics, causing re reflux, causing edema, causing more supraglottic airway obstruction. It's a vicious little cycle, but they often do grow out of it, usually by about a year of age or 18 months. No two babies are affected the same, so you may see strider with agitation only, or with feeding only, or just in certain positions like supine. This vicious cycle may lead to feeding trouble or failure to thrive, so all of these children need close follow-up. Just for fun and just so that we've thought about it at least once, there are actually three types of laryngomalacia from an anatomic perspective. Type 1 is prolapse of the mucosa that overlies the arytenoid cartilage at the glottis. Type 2 comes from tight, foreshortened epiglottic folds. Type 3 is a crazy flippity floppity omega epiglottis that flops over the vocal cords with inspiration. We most likely won't know what type the child has, but we should have a sense of what to do with what severity of symptomatology we have in laryngomalacia. Mild laryngomalacia is not progressive. There are no associated feeding difficulties. These are happy little squeakers. They're okay for reassurance and follow-up. Moderate laryngomalacia progresses over time and causes feeding trouble that does not quite reach a failure to thrive picture. This is also a watch and see approach, although some outpatient physicians will set the child up with an apnea monitor. Severe laryngomalacia is not so common, but it happens enough to mention. The child with severe laryngomalacia has a vicious cycle of edema, all those things we talked about that can cause cyanotic episodes intermittently and failure to thrive over time. These children may need NG tube feedings and possibly surgery. This includes supraglottoplasty in which they burn off excess tissue, typically in type 1, in which there's overlying mucosa of the arytenoid cartilage that prolapses into the airway. The mucosa gets sucked in to the glottis, so the surgeon chars it off with a laser or micro-instruments. In other severe cases, even a tracheostomy is a possibility. True vocal cord paralysis, as opposed to vocal cord dysfunction, it's the second most common cause of newborn strider. There's no gender predilection, and the child usually has biphasic strider before he even leaves the hospital. So hopefully this is caught before we see the child. Vocal cord paralysis can be idiopathic, anatomic, or neurologic. A big consideration is, does this child have hydrocephalus, or perinatal asphyxia, or an encephalocele, or an Arnold Chiari malformation? Something will just seem off to you, abnormal. The parents may not know all the technical terms, and you may not have records, 
But if you see a small infant with biphasic strider since birth and they come to see you for whatever issue, just think, could there be something neurologic going on that we're just not aware of? Just putting that out there. Vocal cord paralysis can also be in the context of a premature delivery. Maybe that child has a patent ductus arteriosus. He gets a PDA ligation. Everything's routine. He gets that tiny little thoracotomy, often done in the NICU itself at the bedside. And we remember the pericardium is dissected with careful attention to sparing that vagus nerve. Except sometimes that damage is only appreciated later when there's some vocal cord dysfunction. Remember that the primary intervention to the vocal cords is from the superior and inferior laryngeal nerves, which are branches of the vagus nerve. If the child is truly in respiratory distress, then do what you know how to do. Take over that airway. But often a little time and sometimes calming will help settle things down. The usual progression of care is this. In-house, the child gets scoped and has a swallow evaluation. If the barium swallow is normal, then they try oral feeding. If that's abnormal, then they do NG tube feedings for about six to eight weeks, and then they repeat the barium swallow study. If it's normal, they progress to oral feeding. If not, a G tube is planned. From our standpoint, we'll most likely see a small infant with frustrated parents who are trying to just make it happen at home. See what's working, what's not, and remember the background for vocal cord paralysis and be conservative. Subglottic stenosis is the third most common laryngeal anomaly. Also, no gender predilection. This can be congenital or acquired. The airway is narrow at about two to three millimeters below the true vocal cords children present with strider that may be so severe that it's biphasic or with dyspnea or with a brassy or barky cough. Oh, bark, bark, bark is not always croup. Mm -hmm, that's right. The child with subglottic stenosis may also present with whiny hoarseness or a weak or unusual cry. Something will alert you that this child is just not doing well at baseline. Congenital subglottic stenosis may present from birth to a few months later, and it's often due to some extrinsic compression from an anomaly the child was born with. Sometimes they get labeled as chronic croupers, but that's just not a thing. If your little patient has recurrent croup, he's in the ED all the time since birth, and he hasn't been scoped, your value added as a thoughtful physician is to keep your mind open to the possibilities and you may end up admitting that little recurrent crouper for a scope because at some point enough is enough acquired subglottic stenosis now we're talking this is emergency medicine acquired subglottic stenosis is often from some prior intubation or trauma usually less than a year of age, but any child up to school age is at risk. Many premature infants you have seen had been intubated as neonates and of course are at risk for subglottic stenosis. Even adults with prolonged intubation can develop it. Just add that to your bag of tricks as the good detective you are in the ED. If you were going down the route of croup in a little one with a barky cough and you decide to get soft tissue films, by the way, run-of-the-mill croup is a clinical diagnosis and x-rays are only for those weirdo cases. Instead of seeing that nice pointy steeple sign where the trachea has a focal narrowing in run-of-the-mill viral croup, subglottic stenosis shows a long linear narrowing of the airway that looks more like a little coffee stirrer. What to do? Well, secure that airway if you have to, but remember, your regular weight-based endotracheal tube size will likely be too small. Remember, have a few backups. Most of the time, the airway is problematic, but stable, and I would prefer to have this done by flexible fiber optic laryngoscopy, preferably in the OR if possible. For stable patients, 
they often will do endoscopic balloon dilatation over time or even laryngeal tracheal reconstruction if it's that bad. That was all about Strider, the high-pitched noise that can be inspiratory, above the glottis, or expiratory, below the glottis, or both at the glottis itself, or just a very severe case anywhere along the airway. As we mentioned, other things, of course, cause Strider, like croup or epiglottitis or foreign body, but you will make those diagnoses through the context of the presentation. You're not going to miss them. Today is all about the otherwise well-appearing child who is just a noisy little squeak box. And we're trying to figure out, is that normal? Until now, we've talked about the squeaks. What about the squawks? How would you describe this sound? Well, medically, we need to know whether you're awake or not when you make that sound. If you're asleep, that's a snore. If you're awake, that squawk, my friend, is stertor. Stertor sounds very much like snoring because uh, the obstruction is at the level of the nasal pharynx or the oral pharynx. Stertor is noisy squawks when awake. What can cause an awake person to have stertor? Well, if you are very little, maybe you have coanal atresia. That is, your coani are blocked. The connection between your nasal pharynx and oral pharynx is either very stenotic or totally occluded. Most cases of coanal atresia are bilateral, and since babies are obligate nasal breathers, they have respiratory distress almost immediately after birth, sometimes needing immediate intubation. The child attempts to breathe through the nose, he can't, he becomes cyanotic, and the cyanosis only resolves when the child opens his mouth to cry. The newborn may not have 100% occlusion and could be sent home with this only to be brought back by parents who describe just such an odd phenomenon. You may hear about noisy breathing associated with feeding difficulty or choking. Can you see where I'm going with this? If the baby comes in with, say, a brew, a brief, resolved, unexplained event, it's not a brew unless it truly is unexplained. To evaluate for coanal atresia, you can pass a small suction catheter gently through each nostril. If you can't, in the right context, you may want to do your own flexible nasal endoscopy if you feel comfortable and you have a pediatric scope or admit them for a formal ENT consult and possibly surgery. If necessary, a CT can diagnose this as well. In mild cases, the infant is supported through this until he's older with maybe saline rinses or supplemental oxygen just to optimize his surgical success as an older infant. Less commonly, you can be born with unilateral coanal atresia and you may not get diagnosed until school age or older. Unilateral coanal atresia presents with recurrent bouts of unilateral purulent nasal discharge or chronic sinusitis. Sometimes coanal atresia is associated with charge syndrome. Remember that one? C for coloboma of the eye, H, heart anomaly, A, atresia of the coanie, R, retardation of growth, G, genital hypoplasia, E, ear anomalies. Treatment for any coanal atresia is always in some way surgical. A physiologically similar presentation is that of congenital piriform aperture stenosis. It's a bony overgrowth of the nasal process of the maxilla starting at about four to five months of age is when you'll start to see some symptoms. The piriform aperture is just a cool way to say the bony and soft tissue tunnel that defines your nasal airway. The nasal septum and spine are medial. The maxilla and inferior turbinate are lateral. Sometimes 
piriform aperture stenosis can be associated with other mid-face dysostoses, or sometimes you're just unlucky. Usually this is a young infant who is constantly presenting with stutter and then failure to thrive. Management is shaving down the bony structures in the OR to open up that nasal airway. A more common cause of stutter, or awake snoring, is a nasal lacrimal duct obstruction. During development, the nasal lacrimal duct on one side does not canalize completely, and you end up with progressive external compression of your nasal airway. The ENT will treat with endoscopic resection or fenestration. Some genetic syndromes will likely present with nasal obstructive symptoms like Down syndrome with midface hypoplasia or macroglossia or hypotonia. A lot of these children will also have OSA. treacher collins syndrome has maxillary hypoplasia and coanal atresia. Cruzon syndrome also presents similarly. Now, you're not going to miss these, and you're not likely to be the first to make these diagnoses. It's mostly just to be aware of these children's specific challenges and needs and potential complications when they show up inevitably to your ED. Now, so far we're talking about noisy babies that we could accidentally send home, but here's just a quick note on a few cases of acquired stutter as older children, adolescents, and adults. Swollen turbinates are a common cause, likely because of chronic inflammation from allergies. You got yourself there the habitual sniffer. Yep, you know who I'm talking about. For sure, you know someone who just sniffs or blows his or her nose constantly. Adults have this problem, but it's even more problematic with children who cause nasopharyngeal edema that's hard to treat, which ends up causing higher negative pressures in the eustachian tubes and, you guessed it, always getting ear infections. So, stop it! Other things to consider in the acquired case of stutter include adenoid hypertrophy, also from untreated allergy, or foreign bodies, maybe that bead that just got forgotten, or nasal polyps or chronic infections. We talked about the squeaks, strider, the squawks, stutter, and now the snores, well, snoring. It's stutter when you are awake, and it's snoring when you're asleep, mostly caused by one of these big three, adenoid hypertrophy, tonsillar hypertrophy, or palatal abnormalities. Now we're talking about older children. Adenoid hypertrophy is the child who always breathes through his mouth. He has a hyponasal voice. What's that? Well, it has to do with voice dynamics. Your voice is an instrument. The sound resonates through your airway, including the contribution you get from the sound traveling out of your nasal pharynx. A hypernasal voice is a very nasally sound. Too much air is directed through the nose. It's kind of like the Kermit the Frog voice. A hyponasal voice happens when air from below never gets up into the nasal pharynx because your adenoids are huge. Kind of like the Muppet animal's voice. Who was that strange blue creature? That my kind of fella. Ah! Okay, well, I, I guess uh, your drums uh, mean a great deal to you, huh? Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, nice. You like them more than food, I guess, huh? They are food. Eat drums, eat cymbals. <laughs> How symbolic. Bad pun. <laughs> yeah. Tonsillar hypertrophy is the typical kissing tonsils presentation. They have mouth breathing and a hyponasal voice since the adenoids block off that connection. Bad snoring, muffled voice, childhood OSA. 
Other congenital syndromes can cause palatal abnormalities, but that's just enough for today. To summarize, if your little patient is a noisy breather, do a good HMP and you'll likely find the cause. If you have a newborn or young infant, ask yourself, inspiratory more than expiratory? Strider, stirter, or snoring? Think about the things we can miss in the little ones, and when in doubt, do a little observation time or phone a friend. If you are in any way concerned, it's just fine to admit for further workup. Until next time, remember, you are the champion for the child in front of you. Take care. Thank you for listening to The Playbook. We welcome your comments, questions, and feedback. Email Tim at coach at PEMplaybook.org or drop by our website for show notes and more strategy at PEMplaybook.org. See you there.